scripture. I believe the Bible, uh, people work overtime to suppress the Bible, so we try to get it into the public purview or into the atmosphere as much as possible. Uh, let's read Romans 1, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 7, 1 through 25. Your first slide has six verses on it. Let's try this together. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. My brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good, then, bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do want what is going, I keep doing on, I'm sorry. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it uh, reveals to us what you are like. We thank you that it reveals to us how you see us and what we are like. And Father, we pray that you would bring the two together. That as we read your word, your Holy Spirit would work in us in such a way so that we become more of what you were like. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. So here's our message map for today. 
We're going to look at how baptism into Christ's death, we saw this last week, baptism into Christ's death releases us from A, being married to sin, and B, to walk in the newness of life. We might call chapter 7 law school. Chuck Missler called it law school. All right, we're going to see how sin seized us through Adam and Eve's fall, and it resonates with our rebellious nature. That's why the law says one thing and we want to do another. We're going to see the law, how the law of marriage explains how we are bound to sin in our first life. And then we are born again in our second life. And, we, and, we, and baptism is a symbol of that. We rise to newness of life. So sin has power over our first life, but it doesn't have power over our born again life. Remember, if you die, if you are born once, you will die twice. If you are not born again, you will die and your soul will be separated from God in hell. But if you are born twice, if you, if you experience the born again experience, you will die, but you will live even though you die. So I'm going to die once. All right, verse 4. Those who are in Christ bear fruit to serve God or serve God's good law by faith through the Spirit. If you're new to Liberty Christian Fellowship, you have blanks in your bulletin, and the blanks in your bulletin will correspond to blue words on the screen. This slide is sort of a synopsis of where we're going and where we've been in the past uh, couple of weeks in Romans, and uh, the next slide is going to start your fill-ins. I would suggest that when the slide turns, if you want the notes, start taking them because we may uh, get through a slide before you get a chance to get them all. Um, somebody told me her technique is to get them all down and then try to listen. <laughs> but I give you the notes so that you have a commentary you can take it home and study it for yourself. Uh, Chuck Mister always says, don't take my word for anything. Um, and J. Vernon McGee says the same thing, by the way. So, now, Romans 6, 3 through 4 explained this to us last week. Baptism into Christ's death buries us to sin and resurrects us to a new life. Remember last week we looked at eight different types of baptisms in the scripture? or eight different episodes of baptism. And the first episode is one that God does. You don't even know what's happening when you're born again. God spiritually baptizes us into Christ's death. He releases us from the law of sin. We are no longer married to the law of sin because he has buried us with Christ. You were married to sin, and now he is unmarrying you to sin. So law is binding on live persons. When God baptized us to share in the death of Christ, we are released from the legal requirements of the law of sin. That's Romans 6, 3 through 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Our physical baptism is, uh, is, is, our, um, is our response to the baptism that God baptizes us with in the heavenlies when we receive Christ. Uh, verse 4. We're baptized into death and it accomplishes these things for us. It buries us to Romans 7, 5, which while living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members. God breaks that in our, in our lives. It's Sanctification is a, is a, is a uh, continuous process. Some of us were sanctified in certain areas of our lives almost immediately. And other times it took, in other, and this, the same sin in my life might have taken longer than it took in your life. God is a believer-specific God. He has, a, he has a particular pace at which he wants you to grow. You can't speed it up, but you can slow it down. Remember Israel going around the wilderness, right? So, when we are baptized into Christ's death, we are released from having to keep the ceremonial laws. Had this discussion with a young man yesterday. Well, that he said, we're no longer under law. I'm like, we, we, we go through this a lot at Liberty Christian Fellowship because we like to split the hairs. Because we want to be accurate. We want to be as accurate as God is. Yes, we are no longer under the ceremonial law. The ceremonial laws in the Old Testament were fulfilled by Christ doing five things. Shall we do them again? They were one. His what? His, his substitution and his bodily, where he is today seated. If someone says I'm a Christian, and they, you have to walk them through those five things. 
When people say, I'm a Christian, I, I say, well, do you believe Jesus was born of a virgin? And I walk them through those five things. If they don't believe in, in all five of those things, they are not a biblical Christian. I don't care what you call yourself. All right? Um, now, when we are baptized, when God baptizes us, he pulls us up from baptism. He resurrects us from, from his spiritual baptism. We come up out of the water. and it, uh, well, it's symbolic. When we come up out of the water, it's symbolic of what God has done here. God releases us to live Romans 7, 6. But now we are released from the law, the ceremonial law, not the moral law. What do I mean by that? Can we murder each other today and get away with it? No. At least not in God's eyes, right? Uh, can, it, when, when, when the Bible was written in the Old Testament, could we murder and get away with it? Could we get a, murder and get away with it when Christ was walking the earth? Can we murder in Christ's millennial kingdom? No. Well, you think we're going to be able to get, get to murder people in heaven? No. So the moral law is an eternal law, but the ceremonial law was a temporary law to try to illustrate to us that you are a sinner, you are a very, very bad sinner, but I'm going to send a wonderful Savior to compensate for your sin. All right? Uh, now, um, it also releases us to fulfill Romans 6, 21 through 22, which says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law of the prophets bear witness to it, to the righteousness of God, which we, abs which we access through faith in Jesus Christ. And that access is available to all who believe. All right, let's start your feelings. Now, sin seizes us through Adam and Eve, through the fall, Adam and Eve's fall, and it slips into our DNA. It slips into everything that we do. It slips into everything that we are. And sin resonates with our rebellious nature. That's why when we hear God's law, we want to, we want to break it. Romans 5.12 says this, Just as sin came into the world through the one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Do you want to lead people to Christ? We first have to see that the Holy Spirit works in them so, to convince them that they're sinners. Otherwise, you know, you don't come to Jesus because he's just going to make you happy. All right? I mean, Jesus didn't die for your happiness. Yeah. He died for your sins. Joy may be an outcome of you submitting to Christ and walking right with him. Now, because we have a sin nature, which positions us to have a natural rebellion towards God, a natural defection in, away from him in apostasy, we have this tendency to want to revolt against our creator. To leave our previous standing in good with him because he had died for us. He has died for our sins. He has credited us with righteousness. We saw that through uh, Abraham and David in chapter 3 or 4, I guess, right? All right. Now, when we hear his commandments, we have a strong tendency to want to break them. Webster's 1828 Dictionary says of rebellion, it's an open and avowed renunciation of lawful authority to which one owes allegiance. Or to traitorously resist the authority, or to traitorously resist lawful authority. Now, because of the rebellion within our nature, sin seizes and it deceives us. Seizing is an activity that means it aggressively lay hold, lays hold of whatever you offer it. Think a thought, you get a feeling, you feel that way long enough, you, you, you're going to act on it. Right? That's why the Bible says we are tearing down strongholds in every argument. We're taking every thought captive. Not me and my own power. I say, Lord, I'm going to release myself to you. I'm giving you permission for your Holy Spirit to work in my life in such a way that you conform me to your will. It's not about all powerful sinner here getting right with God. All right. Now. Uh, Romans seven eleven says this for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me. I thought it was going to feel good, which it did for a moment, maybe. A friend of mine wrote a song, A Moment of Pleasure, A Lifetime of Pain. Deceive means it seduced you away from God's truth by baiting, tempting, and alluring us. And then it kills us. Romans uh, 7.13 says this, Sin works through the good commandment of the law 
to produce death, which is separation from God, in me, and it's proven to be sinful. It proves that, it's, that my sinful nature or sin within me is completely 100% devoted to depravity. How's that for your self-image? <laughs> There's something within us that is detestable and despicable in God's eyes. And it says it's beyond measure. You can't compare it to anything. You know, the Bible talks about two mysteries. There's the mystery of iniquity. We watch the television and we see people doing all these bad things and we go, how can people be so bad? The mystery of iniquity. But then there's the mystery of godliness. God takes wicked old detestable scoffers like us. Smug, proud, arrogant people like us. And he redeems us. And then he sanctifies us. He grabs you by your neck and he shakes your collar and he shakes you every way but loose. <laughs> Would you give God permission to do that in your life? Would you say, Lord, I know what I'm like. Heck, I really, really don't know what I like, what I'm like. You know exactly what I'm like. I kind of get a glimpse of it every now and then when I have the courage to look. <laughs> but I'm going to give you permission to order the circumstances of my life. I'm, getting, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you permission to transform this heart. I'm going to give you permission, Lord, to do for me what I can't do for myself. That is conformed to your image. I need your help. I want to be more like Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would put such a love for you and me that it surpasses all my selfishness. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says this, Rebellion is like the sin of divination. You know how sometimes we think we're doing God's will, but it's really my will for God? That's a form of rebellion. You might as well go practice witchcraft. I wouldn't do that, but two wrongs don't make a right. Job 34, uh, 37 says this, Rebellion multiplies words against God. To his sin, he adds rebellion scornfully. He claps his hands among us, and he multiplies words against God. We are people like that all the time, right? They say, well, I always felt, and I always believed, and I always thought. I always say, you better get your thought and belief in your say in line with what God, God tells us. It's in the Bible. How do we know who Jesus is? There's only one book on the planet. There's only one way on earth to know. What has God given us to reveal himself? The Bible. The Bible. Can't make it up our own, on our own. We can't have holy councils. We can't put on special robes. We can't do anything and burn incense and, 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 have, and, have, and travel great distances to meet with each other and make up our own, our own way to heaven can't go to heaven and say, here I am, God, let me in. I'm the man. It's not going to work. Anyway, Proverbs 17, 11, evildoers foster rebellion against God. The messenger of death will be sent against them. John 5, 22, Jesus says, All, God has given judgment to me, the son. Revelation chapter 4, God, John is harpazled up to heaven. Revelation chapter 5, everybody cries because there's no one worthy to open the scrolls of wrath. And into the picture steps the Lamb of God. John 5, 22, judgment has been given to the Son. And I believe it's, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, Re it's Revelation 6. It might be verse 31. It's somewhere in there. Maybe it might be 12 or 31. And it says that, uh, that the, it calls Revelation the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus loves you so much he went to the cross. But God detests sin so much, he is not going to let it into his heaven. We have to get right with our Lord. We got to get right with that love. I got 20 more scriptures on rebellion, but we're not going to do them all. Let's move on. Um, no, I mean, I got to go through your passions and stuff. I'm sorry. I'm moving on in my notes, but not, not here. So our sinful, uh, the, 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 the flesh hears the word of God and it sparks something within us. I have that happen to me all the time, by the way. Someone's telling me about confessing some sin and they want to get right with God and, and something sparks me and says, man, I'd like to do that. Because my sinful passions are aroused by God's, by, by God's word because I'm, I'm a rebellious twerp. Thank God he, he, he rescues us from acting on that stuff, right? Anyway, so it rises up in us 
on account of the instrumentality, the agency of our flesh, because we are sinners, to work in our various members, your body parts. And I find it to be a law or a force or an influence in and of itself. But God works in me, and I delight in God's law. I identify with God's law. 1 John 1, 9, when we confess our sins, we basically are saying, God, I know your law is good. I violated it and I've done something wrong. God is faithful and just to forgive. When we sin, Jesus Christ does not hop down from the cross and go, man, I just done died for you. Sucker. Twerp. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> no. God's blood is, people say, well, if I come to church, man, the building will fall in. I'm like, you puny sinner, who do you think you are before the, before the all-powerful, righteous God? I had a man once, he was richer, a very rich guy, and he said to me, when I see God, I'm going to punch him right in the nose. I came back for lunch, he goes, so what do you think about what I said? I knew what he said, but I wanted to see if he was stupid enough to say it twice, and he said it three or four times. And he goes, so what do you think? He's trying to show off for his office. I said, Boo, when you see God... Your face is going to hit the ground. You're going to be there 400 years, if you're lucky. If he doesn't send you to hell right away. Maybe after 400 years, he might let your little eyebrow touch, look at his toe and face going to go back down again. If you're lucky. He doesn't send you to hell right away. That man was sobbing in my arms receiving Christ two weeks later. Not because he was scared of going to hell, but he had a lot of problems. He was doing his sins, his sins are catch his earthly sins are catching up to him. All right. So I delight with God. I, I, I see that, that, that God's law is waging war in the, uh, against my members, and my members are waging war against, my, against what God wants me to. Guess who I want to win? God. Who's more powerful? God or my sin? God. He should win. I should, I should be able to be empowered to do what he wants me to do. Let's go on. So, because we all have a sin nature which positions us to have a natural rebellion, a defection towards God, sin seizes the opportunity and aggressively lays hold on whatever I offer it. You say to sin, I'm just going to stick my toe in that water. And sin comes up and grabs you by your ankle and drags you under. So I was deceived, I was, deceased, I was seduced away from believing God. I was seduced away from putting his word first. I was seduced away from my first love. Greatest commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And what does it do? It works death. It separates me from the Lord. If you're, you know, we have a moment by moment walk in Christ. If at one moment you feel yourself out of God's will, just turn around and offer yourself back to him. First John 1, 9. If we're faithful, and, if, we, if, we, if we confess, he is faithful to forgive. Confession just means I agree with God that your law is good and I've, and I'm, and I've been treating it poorly. I've, I've sinned against it. So, you, got, you guys got these, right? Can we move on or you want me to hold on for a moment? Do like my students in school at, at Bible camp. When all the pens are in the air, I'll know we can go on. Now, what is the law? The law is good, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, it leaves us lacking. So people have a tendency to say, well, the law is not good. No, the law is good, you puny sinner. The law is great. The law is not sin, right? But the law teaches us what sin is. The law lets us know, it informs us, it instructs us, it tutors us. I'm so tempted to want to do Galatians next. I'm trying to hear from God if Galatians will be our next book. Uh, um, uh, it tutors us what sin is. The very commandment that promised life. Why did God give us the law not to kill us? He's trying to get you to walk in life. He wants us to walk in life. But because we are sinners, we hear the law and the rebellion rises up against us and we walk in death. The law is good. 
It is intrinsically good. It is that which originates from God and it is empowered by him to give life through faith. I hear all these conservative people saying, well, we're not going to reuse the Bible. There is no way to be conservative apart from God's word. What is conservatism? It's keeping the Ten Commandments. It's the, what is America? What is America conservative? What did our founding fathers do? They applied the Bible to civics. We're not going to rescue this country some other way. We're trying to be conservative without the foundation in the scriptures that our founding fathers had when they invented conservatism. Or at least the American version of it. We're trying to be moral apart from God's Ten Commandments. And, then, and, and think we could go to heaven and say, God, I'm going to climb up my own way. Remember last week? We want to be liberated from our own low standard of living. Most people say that they keep three or four of the Ten Commandments, and they really don't, but they try to pride themselves on doing that. All right, now, for we, we're born again. We know that the law is spiritual. You know what? When does the Bible make sense to people? When you are spiritually reborn. The born-again experience. Before then, the Bible probably is not going to make sense to you. Why? Because Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I am the good shepherd. I wrote the Bible. And if you don't, if you don't submit to me, I'm not going to reveal my word to you. I don't know if this is exactly true, but I kind of experienced this in my life, I think. The more I obey, the more word I get and truth I get. Now, listen, obedience is not healing. I could be sick and still obey God. <clears throat> obedience is not necessarily the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. I don't have to speak. I don't have to do any of that in order to be right with God. Chances are, if I am right with God, He's going to manifest some of those things through me. Let's not get the cart before the horse. Stop seeking the gift. Seek the gift giver. Put your toes on the cliff of faith and say, Lord, my heels are hanging off in space. I'm going to trust you here. I am going to abandon myself to your word. Scary. But wonderful. See, that's why Christianity is really not for the faint of heart. Well, it is. But God will strengthen your heart. He'll strengthen us to trust and obey. All right, let, you got those? Let's move on. Now, the law of marriage, God explains, or Paul uses this analogy. The law of marriage explains how we are bound to sin in our first life and how we are released from sin in our born-again life. See, we tell people, just come to God and He'll make you happy. I was doing an event over in uh, another state a couple of years ago. That night at dinner, the host and her son received Christ. I walked in, and the, the lady says to me, I've been watching your videos, and I don't know, understand it at all, but I know I have to be born again. Can you explain that to me? <laughs> Bert was with me. We looked at each other and go, okay. <laughs> that person sent me a text message about two months ago and said, I'm feeling horrible. I've been treating people terribly. My mouth, the vicious things that have come out of my mouth. Another person said, we think she should step down from all her positions and just get right with God. And I said, no. All she's experiencing are Christian birth pains. This is not unusual. You come to Christ, yes, there's joy involved with the process, but man, you have been a mess, and God wants to straighten out your mess, and it ain't going to be a pretty picture sometimes. Joy will come in the morning. Sometimes we do need to repent. Sometimes the mirror of God's Word shows us the horror story that we have been to the people around us. And we need to make that right. You don't run away. You stay in the game. You keep walking forward. God is not showing you these things because He wants you to quit. 
There is therefore now no condemnation. Godly sorrow is different than condemnation. Don't go wallowing in that. Believe what the word says about you more than, than your own miserable feelings say about you. Even though your own miserable feelings are probably sparked by the Holy Spirit. This is very counterintuitive, isn't it? I'm not, I mean, I'm trying to get you out of depression here. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a challenge. We've all been there. But Jesus Christ said, I, in eternity past, I hung on a cross. In, 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 in eternity pastor, in Genesis, God reached into Genesis and put all the sins on top of me. He reached into Revelation, swept all the sins for all time back on top of me. I've paid for it. Don't quit. Think more about what I say about you in its totality as it is revealed from Genesis to Revelation. Don't go proof texting scripture and making a one verse doctrine and pull yourself out of the game. Stay with me. The book of Revelation is coming. The marriage supper of the Lamb will be yours one day. You'll be at that table. Well, the law is bounding, binding as long as we live. You know, in a, in a sense, spiritually, we die daily. Isn't that what Paul said? I'm skipping along, being myself, happy-go-lucky, I don't care what you think. Holy Spirit touches me, all of a sudden I care what I said to you. And now I, I'm I have to die daily. I got to go through that process sort of all over again. And again. But don't quit. It will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So the law of marriage, which has power over, which, which, which we're married to sin. So when God baptizes us, he buries us and we get resurrected. So with the law, your, your marriage to sin has been broken. Don't go getting remarried so God has to divorce you from it again. Let it go. The law of sin and death, sin and death no longer applies to us. Oh my gosh. Christ's blood is so durable. It is so indestructible. It is so everlasting that it has not only covered my sins, but it also has credited us with righteousness. It, everybody, if we were to take the weight of the sin of everybody in this room, it would be horrendous. Christ's blood is way, way, way more durable than that. Covers the sins of the world. It's amazing. So, you know how the Bible in the Old Testament likens Israel's unfaithfulness to spiritual adultery? That's kind of what we do. God liberates us from that marriage and we kind of want to crawl back to our old lovers. We're the bride of Christ. Let's not go there. We know who are. We know who to whom we are betrothed. Let's live it. No two timing. Let's go on. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And you know, part of the born again process, part of dying daily, part of walking in Christ daily is going through this. You cycle through these things. I remember one time someone told me, I read this book and it said you should uh, write down all the sins that you ever did to confess unto Christ. Four days later, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I, can't, I can't wallow in this. I've got, I got to let this go. <laughs> He's died for all of them anyway. <laughs> So, who will deliver me? That's a one word answer. What's his name? Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. I serve the law. But we're not under law. Look what Paul says. I serve the law. Spiritual growth is growing in sensitivity to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's a two-way street. There's a lot of things God wants you to do, let alone what He doesn't want you to do. The list of what He doesn't want you to do is only 10 things. 
Well, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you can add anger to that. You can add looking to lust or to looking to adult, looking in lust to adultery. So, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, everybody says, oh, we're, we're not under the law. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ ups the ante on the Ten Commandments. He goes, when my Holy Spirit is in you, you've heard it say, thou shalt not murder. But when my Holy Spirit is in you, you will be convicted about being angry. I keep telling these stories. I was in a restaurant once. A lady came over to me. She goes, I'm, I resent what you're talking about. And I said, well, I'm sorry. She comes back later and says, I told you I resented what, you, what you're talking about. Aren't you going to stop? And I said, no, 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 no. You misunderstand me. I'm sorry that you're resentful <laughs> because you'll go to hell mess talking like you're talking. All right. Now, I serve the law. When the Holy Spirit, when we grow in Christ, he grows us to, 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 to walk in obedience to the law. The moral law. What's happening in our society right now is a tragedy. People are denying God's laws. They have their own. They're making up their own. So now they want us to be enslaved to their 10,000 laws. Not going to happen. Not on my ship. Going to resist it every day. Let's move on. I think this is our last slide. Yeah. Let's pray. God, give us the grace and mercy for you to work in us in such a way so that there seems to be no space, no light, no challenge between who we are and what you are like. Now I know that that's a very high calling, but that's our goal. Your word says we should be perfect because you're perfect. And we know we're not perfect. We're not going to, we're not going to play head games and pretend we're perfect. But Lord, we expect that you are an almighty, all-powerful God and that you will show up in our hearts and show up in our minds. And you will actually work in our sinful beings to move us towards that state. We trust you. We know that you're, you are 100% capable of working within us. I pray that you would give us the grace so that we could release ourselves to you so you can show up in our hearts and do your work. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said.